Hey, Zach here from Frontenac Outfitters Canoe and Kayak Center. Today we're going to have a look at kind of what goes into a canoe, the components of a canoe. Uh, we'll quickly go over the varieties of materials that are used to build a canoe and just some of the different things that you might find when you're either ordering a canoe, looking at used one, uh, or thinking of, of buying a new one. So let's have a look. Here we're having a look at the H2O Prospector. This is in a Kevlar layup with a clear coat on it. We'll kind of get into the, into the weeds uh, a little bit of what that means when we talk about different layups. Let's start with the components and stuff you're going to find on, uh, on your typical canoe. So starting here at the bow, the bow being the front of the boat, and you have the stern at the back of the boat. We have our plastic end caps, and these can be a different material. You can have wood, uh, plastic, vinyl, uh, different materials, just kind of matching different situations for, for what the, the characteristics of the canoe are. Down here on the front, uh, this one might be hard to see on the camera, but we do have some skid plates installed on here. A skid plate is a, an optional thing. Uh, they add a bit of weight. Generally, they're gonna be made out of Kevlar, saturated in a resin, and then attached to, uh, to the front and back of the canoe. They don't generally run the entire length of the canoe, just at the front. So if you're coming into shore, either in forward or reverse, they're gonna take a little bit of that impact, prevent, help protect the bow and stern of the canoe uh, from rough shore launches and, and landings. Inside the canoe, generally on most uh, composite canoes, for sure, plastic ones sometimes forego this because of different reasons, but you'll have a flotation chamber inside of here. What that does is add positive buoyancy in the event that you capsize. It's gonna help keeping that canoe floating nice and high uh, making rescue much easier. Coming a little further back, you're gonna have a dedicated carry handle. They can be made out of different materials. Oftentimes you can attach a painter line to here. On some models, uh, or as an additional accessory, you can add eyelets into the front if you want a dedicated spot to put a painter line uh, for lining your canoe or for tying it up. As we come further back, you're gonna notice the gunnel system. So the gunnels are basically what incorporate kind of the edges of the canoe, so to speak. It's a on here, this is an aluminum gunnel. You can get them in wood, although the price of wood has gone up dramatically. Uh, so installing them isn't generally something a lot of people go for anymore, and they do require a lot of maintenance too. So we prefer uh, aluminum or vinyl gunnels. Um, the, some of the fancier higher-end boats will have an integrated gunnel, which is going to be a composite gunnel, uh, and there's big benefits to having those as well. Uh, coming back, we have our bowman seat or bow person seat. Uh, so this is going to be directed towards the bow of the canoe. I've seen many people getting into their canoes and paddling them backwards, and it can be done solo, and it's you know oftentimes preferred. But when you have two people in the canoe, how do you tell which one is the bow person and which one is the stern? Well, generally, the amount of space between the bow and the first bowman seat is going to be significant so that they can get their legs in place. If you find that you get in the canoe and you've only got this much space, it's probably because you're facing the wrong way. A lot of these canoes are symmetrical in design, so that means it doesn't matter which way you point them other than knowing where the seat is located and you're pointing in the right direction. I know it seems kind of silly, but it happens. If you don't know, you don't know. As we come a little bit further back, you're gonna have your yoke. Not all canoes are always going to come with a yoke. Sometimes it'll just be kind of a thwart bar, which is what this looks like. But if you plan on portaging your canoe, I would definitely recommend having a yoke on there. So on our yoke here, this one is classed as a deep dish yoke. You can have a standard flat yoke, which has that kind of contour shape to it, but it's essentially a straight bar across. We don't see a lot of those anymore. They're not super comfortable to carry, but certainly on kind of some less expensive models, often fi you'll find that you have that standard yoke. It's cheaper to produce, which is the main reason it goes on less expensive canoes. Deep dish yoke, if you're planning on doing any kind of distance portaging, you've got a heavier canoe, that deep dish yoke, it makes a really, really big difference. And I would highly recommend upgrading to that if it's an option. Uh, generally, it doesn't cost a whole lot more and it's, it's totally worthwhile doing. Coming a little bit further back, we have our thwart. Now this here adds structure to the canoe. So you'll find this generally on canoes that are 15 feet and longer, sometimes on shorter, generally not though. The, the yoke itself can handle that distribution of weight um, and keep the shape of the canoe. This here just helps add structure to the canoe, uh, giving it extra rigidity so it doesn't kind of buckle when you're, when you're paddling it around and causing, well, reducing the amount of flex in the hull. The thwart could also be replaced for a kneeling thwart and a kneeling thwart essentially does the same job except it moves the thwart down into an angled position a few inches down from the top of the gunnels here so you can get into a kneeling position mainly going to be used for solo canoeing so you can have that option of either a kneeling thwart or paddling from the bow seat in reverse if you're paddling solo moving back we've got our stern seat another kind of identifier as to if you're paddling in the right direction like we just mentioned is 
the width of that seat. Generally, the stern seat is going to be much, much narrower than what it is on the bow seat. And that's a really good indicator as well that you have got yourself in the right position. And coming back again, we've got our stern carry handle and our stern float tank, just like we do on the front. The end caps on here, um, what are they used for? Well, it's, it's to add protection to the canoe. So if you drag the canoe on the bottom or you kind of tip it down, they are designed to be replaceable um, so that if it wears out or you break it, that it can be easily replaced without having to worry about mangling gunnels up and that type of thing. Again, on the back, we've got our stern uh, skid plate on there just to add that extra protection. Uh, like I said, do keep in mind, skid plates will add a little bit of weight, generally about a pound or two, depending on the size of them, but it can also kind of give you that peace of mind that you've got that extra protection on the canoe. Are they required on every boat? Absolutely not. You know, if you're looking for the lightest weight canoe and you're going to take care of it, you're not coming in the shoreline hot and, you know, scraping up your canoe, I would say forego them. Then on the stern, uh, on the, what are we here? The port side or the right hand side of the canoe, we have our rating plate or our serial number plate, I should say. Um, on these particular H2O canoes, the, the weight is actually stamped in there. Every canoe is weighed off the line, so you know exactly how much that canoe weighs with all the features that were included on that particular canoe. So we'll quickly chat about different materials you'll find your canoe made out of. And much like kayaks uh, or sup boards, any watercraft really, um, you can have a multitude of, of different materials to make a canoe. There's plastics, you can have ABS, you can have rotomolded polyethylene. Uh, the advantage of those, well, they're generally super durable, but they're also very heavy. Usually the price tag is a little bit lower compared to your high-end com composite canoes as well. On the composite side of things, uh, there's fiberglass, Kevlar, Inegra basalts, carbon Inegra, mixtures of these materials uh, to create different structure profiles, uh, different weights, different durabilities. Um, you know, there's a really kind of an endless chain of ways that, that they can build a composite canoe and, and figuring out what is going to work best for you probably worth a chat with an outfitter like ourselves so we can kind of really dial in what that canoe is likely going to weigh and how durable it is going to be for your particular application if you want a whitewater canoe well it's probably not going to be the 35 pound ultralight carbon and negra canoe there's also aluminum canoes uh, i'm sure everybody's probably familiar with the old grumman uh, there's a couple manufacturers around um, you know i might get some hate mail for this personally i'm not a big fan they are super durable for sure to a degree. Uh, they're, they tend to be a little heavy. Some can be light, but uh, for the most part, they tend to be heavy, uh, very loud in the water. They kind of echo every little bit of water noise if you hit them with the side of the paddle. Um, so I'm not a big fan. If you love your aluminum canoe, all the power to you. I hope it, it brings you lots of joy. Um, and much like the canoes themselves, we can have the outfitting or the seats and the yoke built out of different materials too. A lot of manufacturers you'll find are moving into uh, lighter weight materials like carbon. Uh, so they're having, you know, they're, they're kind of creating new yokes out of carbon, which is pretty cool to see. Um, you know, you're not saving a ton of weight, but you are saving weight. For some people, I mean, every ounce you can save is huge. Typically the woods you'll find in a canoe, usually ash. Ash has been around for eons as far as using it in canoes. It's, it's fairly heavy, but uh, it's robust. It can take a lot of abuse. doesn't need a lot of maintenance because uh, it, it doesn't have that porous quality that some lighter woods have. Uh, cherry is another really popular one, mainly for the aesthetics of it because it's a little bit richer than the ash is. Aspen is uh, another popular one. It's, uh, it's lightweight and still fairly strong, so it can, it can you know, lighten the load a little bit while still giving you good reliability as far as, you know, seat breakage or yoke breakage. You know, maintenance is something important to keep in mind. Uh, you know, if you're storing your boat outside, the wood can dry out and it's going to need to be kind of protected and looked after. So certainly something to keep in mind when you're picking the trim as, as, as well as the gunnels on the side of the canoe. Another term you'll often hear is uh, gel coated canoes or painted canoes versus clear coat canoes. This one here, this is a clear coat boat. So there's no paint on this to give it that yellow color. It's a Kevlar layup. And that is the natural color of Kevlar cloth. It's kind of this golden yellow. Gel coated boats, well, there's advantages to gel coat. The gel coat itself adds UV resistance. So if you're storing it outside, which I, I don't generally recommend storing the canoe in the sun, whether it's gel coated or not, that gel coat's gonna help provide a little bit of UV resistance to the outside of the canoe. So why isn't every canoe UV protected with gel coat? Well, it adds weight, right? You figure it's gonna take a good can of paint or two to actually gel coat a canoe, you take that weight of that, that gel coat, you know, you're easily gonna be five to 10 pounds 
of additional weight that you could save by building a clear coat canoe. The cost of clear coated boats is generally higher because they take more precision to build because you want them to look good. So you can't just kind of have the cloth all quickly mangled in there because you know you're just going to hide it in gel coat anyway. So the precision of building a lightweight canoe in a clear coat is much higher than it is of building one with a gel coat on it. Uh, and I think the last portion worth mentioning is on the bottom of the hull. Canoe can have a keel or no keel. There's benefits and drawbacks to both. What you're going to find is most canoes with a round hull, and we'll get into kind of canoe design in theory in another video. But what you'll find with a round hulled canoe is you don't want a keel on it. You want to keep that maneuverability high. Um, as a more intermediate to advanced paddler, you're probably going to benefit more from having a keelless canoe. Not to say that advanced paddlers can't use a keeled canoe, but we'll find more fishermen, recreation canoeists, or beginners are going to kind of gravitate more towards that keel design. They have a flatter bottom. They have that shoe keel that aid with tracking and stability. You can have a deeper keel than the shoe keel. And again, we can kind of get in all this in a, in a separate video. But I just want to give you the idea that canoes can have a keel or they can have no keel. It's up to you. If you need help kind of distinguishing what's going to work best for you, best to talk to somebody as an expert who is going to be able to help you along that journey to figure out what's gonna work best for you. So this has been a video on kind of the different parts and components of a canoe to just kind of get you up to speed. I hope this helps. If you need any more information, feel free to give us a call, send us an email, uh, or check out the website, frontknockoutfitters.com. Thanks for watching.